Hello, my name is John Mad Dog Hall, and I'm the Executive Director of Linux International and the Board Chair for the Linux Professional Institute. I am here today to talk about what is Libre Culture and why is it good for Mexico. For those of you who do not know me, I have been in the programming field for over 50 years. I've been more than a programmer. I've been a systems administrator. I've been a product manager. I've been marketing manager. I've been a CEO of companies. I've been a consultant. I've taught at the university level. I have written books and many magazine articles and blog articles. But of all the things that I have been, I like to pride myself on the fact that I am pragmatic. I solve problems. I'm not deeply religious about anything, and even about free and open source software. I feel that if people want to use proprietary software, that is their business. It's just I believe that free software is the best method of doing that, and therefore I promote that as a way of doing business. No one really buys a computer. They don't buy software. You don't go into a person's house or office and see a piece of hardware stuck on the wall with two candles on either side like a shrine. Uh, unless, of course, your name is Steve Wozniak and the computer is the Apple One, which is worth a lot of money. Nobody buys software. You don't go into a person's office and see a box of software on the wall with a candle on either side like a shrine, unless, of course, your name is Bill Gates or Larry Ellison, the president of Oracle. What people really buy is a solution, a solution to a problem. And it just so happens that computers are very good at solving lots of problems. And so people would buy the computer and they'll buy the software in order to solve that problem. And even if the problem is simply to play a game, they could perhaps do that by two, using two tin cans and a string, but instead they buy a computer to do that. So that is why people buy computers and software. They buy it to solve a problem. Now, IBM used to sell hardware and software. You would see their ads all the time. Buy this hardware, buy this software from IBM. But a number of years ago, they decided to sell off their laptop division and then later their small server division to Lenovo. And they took that money and they bought a company called Price Waterhouse Cooper. That allowed IBM to double the size of their service and solutions business. Because IBM realized that if all you were selling was the hardware and the software, that you might have a 2 to 3% uh, profit ratio on that. And that was simply not enough to keep a company like IBM alive. They needed a 19 or 20% profit ratio, and they got it by providing services to their customers. Most of closed source, nobody really cares about. If you take a look at all the features of your operating system or all the features of your office package, how many of those things do you really know how to use? And what most people want out of an operating system is that it helps you solve your problem by acting as a platform for the solutions that you need. And if the operating system runs on your hardware and it runs fast enough and it's stable on your hardware, that's what most people want. And likewise of an Office package, how many of the features of Microsoft Office do you really know how to use and do you use? Those features have been built up over the years of people saying, oh, I think it'd be a great idea for Microsoft Office to do this. And then they would analyze that and say, well, how many more packages of Microsoft Office do you think we would sell if we implemented that feature? And then sometime in the future, the person that asked for that feature you know, stopped using Microsoft Office, died or retired or something like that. But that feature is still there and they still support it. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, why are you buying that software? Why are you looking for that software? And maybe the software you're looking for is 
too big, too complex, and too expensive for you really to use. So we have to think about what is open source really? What is the value of open source as opposed to closed source? Well, one of the reasons that people write open source software is because they need that particular functionality themselves. And they think that by implementing it themselves, they can implement it better than somebody who's simply paid to implement that particular functionality. They also realize that by, co by cooperating, they can create a lower cost to this mainstream set of code. And in, in the case of most free software projects, that cost is free, although there is never anything in life which is really free, not even a mother's love. But they can cooperate to reduce that cost. They also can cooperate together to do active research. Universities and you know, research organizations can cooperate together and actually share the code of the research back and forth to come up with the solution to that research that much faster. Many times standard bodies, when they're working on a complex standard like OSF or TCP IP, they create sample code to show people how to implement those standards. And a lot of times companies can simply take that sample code and use it as their, as their implementation, or oftentimes they also contribute to that code to make it work better, perhaps on their hardware or their situations, their operating system. This can also create a base for incremental improvement of that code where people just contribute their improvements as time goes on. And open source can be used to help create prototypes for new products. But then what is free software? Well, it's everything that open source has and a guarantee of those same rights to end users. Open source allows developers to use the source code that we find to make binary products. They may not pass on their changes to that source code. They may simply say, well, there's the original source code, but I'm gonna keep my changes, my improvements, my updates to me and to the people who I give these binary products to. They're allowed to do that through an open source license. But free software, and the most famous license of this is the GNU GPL, compels the developers to, who make those binaries to give the sources or make available the sources to the end users so that end users can now also fix problems. End users can also extend the software to meet their needs. End users can also extend the lifetime of those products beyond where the developers are willing to support them. So for example, XP was retired at a time that many people were still using it. And it would have been nice if they could have given the source code to people for when Microsoft XP so that they could then uh, extend the life of XP however long they wanted to do it. Now, let's take a look at how much money Mexico actually pays for closed source products. Mexico has about 39% of the population of the United States. And yet 49% of Mexico's desktop software was pirated. This is from statistics created by the Business Software Alliance report of 2018. Now, they also say in that report that 791 million US dollars of software was purchased. So 600, 760 million US dollars was pirated and 791 million was actually purchased. And if you take and add those two numbers together, you find out that it's over 1.5 billion US dollars of software value was used by Mexico, desktop software used by Mexico. Now, Again, if you take average Mexican programmer's salary of 17,700 US dollars, 
you can then find out that if Mexico used free software and then took that $1.5 billion and paid it to Mexican programmers to make that software better, they could create an additional 87,600 jobs in Mexico. And I say additional jobs because those jobs would be in addition to using all of the free software that you can get off of the net. So Software Libra amplifies programming capabilities. You start with a solution that is represented by Software Libra packages that you get from SourceForge or you get from GitHub or GitLab. And these solutions may be databases or geographical information software or statistical software and much, much more. Hundreds of thousands of packages exist with millions of programmers contributing to them. And then you leverage using that software Libra to create the solutions that you really want. Programmers can glue these different pieces of software together and extend it to meet the needs of Mexican people. So a lot of times people say, who gets better service? I buy my software from a large company who create, gives me really great service. Really. Unless your name is General Motors or perhaps the Mexican government, the question is, when you write a bug problem to a large company, how likely is it that that company is going to fix that problem, particularly for you? Or oh, maybe if millions of people write a bug problem that are the same one, they might get some recognition for the problem and it might get fixed. But your particular little problem, how often do you actually get a fix? Or even a good workaround for that problem. It's typically met with silence. Now, with open source, you can make a business decision about whether you want to fix that problem or not. Because you have the source code, you have the ability to find a programmer who could fix that for you, and you can make the choice about whether you want to pay that programmer to fix that problem. And if you do, you might want to give that fix back to the free software community so that they can incorporate that fix into the next release of the software and it will be delivered to you when the software is released again. But this moves the decision back to you. You are now in control and not the large company. People often say to me, what's more secure, closed source software or open source software? They say that closed source software is more secure because the people trying to break in can't see how the software works and can't figure it out. Well, if that was the case, then Microsoft would be the most secure company on the face of the earth. And it's obvious that they are not. People say, well, people can see the bugs in, in software Libre and, and they can then exploit them. That might be true, but the thing is, you can fix the bugs. You can, you know, and you can get a quicker fix for that problem, for that security issue. So when you talk about security or you talk about reliability, you typically come up with two main issues. The mean time between failure. In other words, how often does a failure happen? And it's about equal in both closed source and open source. But the next thing you have to think about is mean time between failure. I mean, I'm sorry, mean time to fix. Mean time to fix is how long does it take you to fix that problem once the problem is recognized and once the problem can be worked on? And with closed source software, it may exist for a long time and you'll never be able to get the source code to fix it or even the patch to fix it. With free software, once the patch is available, it's available for everybody at the same time. And that's whether your, your operating system is working on Intel or ARM or Motorola, whether it's being in a enclosed system or whether it's on your desktop. 
it's available to everybody. Whether it's the current release that the that the organization has put out, or whether it's a release of three or four years ago where the bug still existed, it's just that nobody recognized it. You can make the business decision about where and when you're going to fix that problem. Now, this brings up the, the question I brought up before. <clears throat> How many of you had Microsoft XP systems that were still useful, the hardware was still there, and Microsoft came along and said, oh, that's it, we're never going to patch this again. You're never going to get a security patch. You're never going to get any upgrades. You're never going to have this ported to a new piece of hardware that isn't supported at this time. And people said, oh, well, I guess I have to go to Windows 7. Well, that wasn't necessarily easy because Windows 7 wasn't necessarily guaranteed to work on the same system as your Microsoft XP. And so maybe you had to buy new hardware to put Windows 7 on. And that was a problem because maybe you didn't have the money to do that. So when you take a look at making a purchase, you really, a lot of times people talk about total cost of ownership. And they say, what is the lower cost overall? Well, if you're working with closed source software, you have to think about the license fee and the maintenance costs that you have to pay the company to get the bug fixes and everything. And then the training that you have to put in to be able to use that piece of software. Well, in free software, you have much the same types of costs, except you don't have to pay the license fee. There is no real maintenance cost that you pay, or you can make the argument, yes, I have to pay that, but I pay that to a free software person who lives in my country. And then there's the training. And the training is, you know, every day you do the training and you have to train for both closed source and open source. Now, a lot of times these total cost of ownership studies go for five years. And then they stop. And people say, oh, look, the total cost of ownership of closed source software is about the total cost of ownership of free software. But they don't go on to the sixth year. The sixth year is when the company that sold you that software says, oh, oh, you have to buy a new version. That's another license fee. And you have to pay that license fee again. That's what we call a step function. It's a big jump in the total cost of ownership. With free software, you do not have that. You just continue to use the software. You continue to get the updates. What about repurposing and reselling your old hardware? A lot of closed source software licenses say that you cannot do that or there are restrictions on how you do that. And of course, with free software, that doesn't exist. If you could sell your old hardware with a working operating system to somebody else, that means that in effect, your total cost of ownership of the original project has been reduced. So no matter whether you talk about total cost of ownership on closed source software or open source software, you have to say, what is the return on investment? How much more money would I save if I could make the software work exactly like I want to? Maybe I don't have to buy this huge package called PeopleSoft and then convert it down to the point where it works on the hardware which I have. Maybe I can have two pieces of software work very well together and then this can cut down on the amount of manual intervention I have to do, <clears throat> making one piece of software work well with the other one. Another issue is rules of commerce. When I was in business, people would always tell me, you have to have two sources of supply. If you're buying machine screws, you want to make sure that you can get those machine screws from two different companies in case one company runs short or one company goes bankrupt or one company moves away or whatever. And so you would do that. It 
that doesn't seem to work with computer software or hardware because people say, oh, this is why I buy my software from big companies like Microsoft, you know, or, or I can get my, my Microsoft software from Hewlett Packard or IBM or Dell, but they all get it from Microsoft. And so what would happen if this company goes out of business? What would happen if Microsoft went out of business? How long would it take for somebody to learn that code and to redo that? And people say, well, this is why I buy from a big company because they'll never go out of business. And so to them, I say, did you ever hear of a company called Enron? They were the world's largest supplier of energy and they went out of business in a very short period of time. Or Nortel, the second largest communications company on the face of the earth, they went out of business. Or Kodak, one of the largest camera companies in the face of the earth. Or Digital Equipment Corporation, the second largest computer company. And while it's true that digital was bought by Compaq and Compaq was bought by Hewlett Packard, there were product lines along the way that disappeared because the companies that bought them said, oh, we've already got one of those. We don't need that. And the people who had bought those products were stuck with them, were stuck without support. Another issue that comes up is embargo, where a particular country says, we're not going to allow you know, people to work with these other countries. Now, the United States is famous for using embargoes to be able to punish other countries, not for business practices, but for political practices. So the United States had an embargo on Vietnam for 20 years. They had an embargo against Cuba for 60 years, so long that most of us have forgotten what the embargo is about. They still have an embargo against Iran, against Venezuela. They used to have an embargo against the Soviet Union. They're now friends with Russia. And with the United States, you can never determine when this embargo is going to pop up. And what does this mean to Mexico? Is this something that you can bet your entire country on? That is a problem. And what would happen if civil unrest happens? It doesn't have to be a nuclear explosion that hits you know, Redmond, Washington and wipes out Microsoft so that you can't get any bug fixes or things for a while. What would happen if it's, say, a virus like COVID-19 and it makes everybody sick? That's also a problem. And this is something that you cannot allow Mexico to suffer from. Another issue that happens with closed source software is something we call a brain drain. A lot of Latin American universities, and particularly public ones, are free of tuition for qualified students. If the students work really hard and they're really smart and they do well and they're schooling everything and they take their graduate exams and they get in, they can have a free tuition. But after a few years, a lot of these graduates work in Mexico, and then all of a sudden they say, well, you know, in Silicon Valley, they have some really great jobs. Over in Europe, they have some really, in China, they have some really great jobs. I'm going to try and move there. And so your best and your brightest and most experienced people may move out of Mexico and go to these other countries, and you have now lost your investment. Not only in the investment you made in them as students, but investment in your future. Because what happens is that they want to work on interesting problems. That's why they move. They want to be paid good money for the, doing the things that they love to do. That's why they move. And when they move, they take away a lot of the brain power that could help you solve your own interesting problems. And it creates a shortage of engineering and manufacturing expertise inside of Mexico, which makes it difficult to attract new industry and new research parks 
to Mexico because these companies do not want to bring their people from wherever they're coming from, Germany or Japan. They want your people to be able to run their research parks and their industry. And what this does, by having all these interesting jobs leave Mexico, it creates a greater reliance on things like custom duties to generate the taxes to run your country instead of a more progressive tax of an income tax that says the more you earn, the more tax you can pay, but the more you get to keep. Think about the billions of pesos that are flowing out of Mexico to buy Microsoft operating systems, Microsoft Office, Microsoft this, Oracle that, okay, Adobe this, pesos that could be spent on Mexican programmers improving free and open source software to make it better. If you took that 1.5 billion US dollars flowing out of Mexico every year and bring that back to Mexico to generate jobs for Mexicans in interesting high paid jobs. Then what happens is those Mexicans use that money to buy local food, local housing, and pay local taxes. This keeps people inside of Mexico, your best people inside of Mexico, which is what you want to do. Closed source software also teaches only one time. If you use closed source software to teach students in university, the students learn how to use that closed source software in order to solve the problems they want to solve. If it's statistics, they might use a statistical package that's closed source. But if they use free and open source software, that teaches three times. They do learn how to use that software to solve their problems. In the case of statistics, it would be the language R. They also can see how the software works. How does the software solve that problem? So that's the second way they learn. And finally, they could learn how to make that software better, how to work with the open source community to generate the patches, the fixes, and the extensions to make that software better. Open hardware also teaches. And one of the reasons why the Raspberry Pi was created was because professors in Cambridge, England, saw that the students coming into their courses knew less than the students of 20 years ago. And they said, this is crazy because computers are so much more sophisticated. But the problem was that the high school students would get a new laptop and on the laptop, there was this label that said, if you open up this laptop, you lose your warranty. And of course, the laptop may cost a $1,000 and the students say, well, I don't want to lose my warranty on this. So they never open it up. They never see how it works. They never get to change it or modify it. And so the professors at the University of Cambridge created the Raspberry Pi and created the open program to teach students not only how to use the Raspberry Pi to solve problems, but how to change the Raspberry Pi to make it better, how to extend it with things like GPIO pins and so forth. But the Raspberry Pi is not enough because it doesn't show you how to manufacture the Raspberry Pi. It doesn't give people the experience of manufacturing the Raspberry Pi or actually designing the Raspberry Pi or how to create a supply chain inside of the country to make it in case of disaster. What about security? We touched on it lightly before, but I'm going to bring another level of security because you are Mexico and you need to have it. Can you say National Security Agency, NSA? The NSA is an agency of my country who, quite frankly, spies on everybody. And 
closed source companies will tell you, oh, you can look at the source code that we've written inside of special centers. And you can go to the center and they'll check you in. They'll make sure you don't have any cameras. And they make sure you don't have any laptops or any writing material. And you can inspect the perhaps 50 million lines of code looking for trapdoors, Trojan horses, and things like that. But even if you were able to look at the 50 million lines of code, how do you know that that code actually made the binaries that are on your system? You don't. You don't know. And so this whole mechanism that these companies have set up is a farce. It is stupid. They're playing you for fools. Now, free and open source companies will let you inspect their source code. In fact, they'll give you their source code and they'll let you build that code on your own systems using what we call reproducible builds. And if you follow the steps of the reproducible builds, you will take their source code and then you will create exactly the binaries that they give you. And you can compare them bit for bit that the binaries are exactly the same. And this encourages you to know that that source code made your binaries. Unfortunately, that is not enough because in your hardware, there are tiny little programs called BIOS and UEIF boot codes to supposedly ensure you that you have a secure boot. There may be binary blobs that drive your NVIDIA uh, GPUs or other types of firmware, your Win modems. And then inside of the CPU itself, particularly Intel and AMD CPUs, there are things known as microcode, which are, again, tiny little programs. And so what you have to do is have open, inspectable hardware that you can look at, that people that you trust, your own citizens, can look at to be able to see whether or not you are secure. And even with that, you're not secure because as soon as the packets go out of the system, you need to have private virtual networks making sure that you're not being spied upon as your packets go out over the internet. You need to encrypt everything. And while some people say that encryption is bad, encryption is actually your friend because encryption is the easiest way of having authentication. How do you know that the person you're talking to is actually the person you think it is? That is authentication, and it's typically based on encryption. You also need encryption to have trusted, secure storage, and particularly to keep this storage inside your own borders. Your most secret, most private information should be kept as close to you as humanly possible. You also need to learn free and open source software and hardware business models. You can make money with free and open source software and hardware. IBM found out how to do that. Red Hat knows how to do that. You can teach these methods in schools and universities. How does free and open source hardware and software bring you more money than otherwise? Here's an example from St. Petersburg, Russia. There are turbine test beds that test the turbine steam turbines to see how efficient they are. They are buildings, they have huge turbines set up inside of them, and engineers who are designing these turbines that go into hydroelectric plants, that go into steam plants for electricity generation, they send these turbines to this, these places and they hook up sensors to them and they measure the efficiency of the turbines. Now, there are four of these companies that are proprietary and they use proprietary software. And the problem with that is that the proprietary software um, 
It takes about 10 months if you have even the simplest change to make to it because you have to tell the company that you want the change made. You have to create the contract to do that. They figure out how to do it and they come back to you. But one of the turbine test beds in St. Petersburg uses free and open source software to do that. And they build their own turbine test so software and they then allow the engineers who create the turbines to access that from their own facilities. And you can see the, the graphs and the charts and everything that they generate from this free software that they have written. They can typically implement changes that the engineers want overnight. So the engineers get these changes nine months and three weeks early. And to engineers who are trying to design a turbine, this is very important because it gets them, gives them the time to bring out the next version of the turbine very quickly. Now, people say to me all the time, oh, Mad Dog, it'll take us a long time to implement free software throughout our country, throughout our university. It's going to take a long time to convince people. The students will have to learn it. The students will have to go out to industry to take their skills and everything. And I really don't care. I've been coming to Mexico and to Latin America ever since 1994 when I started into GNU Linux. And I've always told the story of these three countries. Liechtenstein was at one time the poorest country in Europe. But their king came back from Austria where he'd been hanging out and he said, hey, my country is in shambles. I'm going to come up with a plan I'm going to tell the people what the plan is. I'm going to convince the people to implement the plan and they'll all be behind me. And in 10 years, Liechtenstein went from being the poorest country in Europe to the richest on a per capita basis. Malaysia at one time was the poorest country in Asia. And they had a new prime minister who came up with a plan, sold it to the people, they all started marching in the same direction. And after 25 years, they were the richest country in Asia on a per capita basis. The same with Ireland that developed a plan to become a technological country. And in 10 years, they became one of the richest countries in Europe. If Mexico had started on this plan in 1994, you would be there by now. You could be the richest country in Central America, if not all of Latin America. So the journey of a thousand miles has to begin with a single step. And that's the most important thing. So with that, I will say to you, thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I will try and answer them.